Father, we thank you for this uh, section of Isaiah 40 that we're going to look at today. I pray, Lord, that you would work through your word to bring us comfort and joy. Pray that you'd help us to understand what it is that you've written, help us to know what you want us to do with it, uh, help us to know you better, Lord, and better understand our relationship to you and the things that you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the last of our short Christmas series through Isaiah 40. We've talked about the book of Isaiah and how it's a, a series of warnings of coming judgment that God, through the prophet Isaiah, about 740 years before Jesus, is over and over warning the people of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, that unless they turn around, bad things are coming. They had already seen their northern neighbors, the northern kingdom of Israel, called Israel, conquered by the Assyrians years before. Isaiah promised that the Babylonians were going to come and conquer the southern kingdom and take people off to captivity. For 39 chapters, it's warning after warning after warning. And then we get to chapter 40, and it changes its tone to one of encouragement and comfort and promise and joy to look forward to. We're going to wrap up that chapter today with the last few verses. The people of Judah, by the time they are in captivity, and maybe go back and remember what Isaiah had said in 40, they're probably wondering, has God abandoned us? We've been stuck here in Babylon for decades Will we ever go back to the land that God had promised us? Or as he just walked away and washed his hands and maybe found himself another chosen people. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, if you've ever wondered if God has abandoned you. If maybe younger years of your life were filled with a closeness and an intimacy with God, and then at some point later on in life you felt like there was no connection there. And you didn't know if you'd walked away or if it seemed like maybe God had had lost track of you, was ignoring you, and wasn't hearing your cries, the whole nation was probably feeling that way. And if they would have gone back and read what we call chapter 40 of Isaiah, they would have seen these promises, and some of them would have been encouraged, and others would have said, yeah, right, reality says something different. If there is a God, like our ancestors say, and if we were his chosen people, we we are not now. We have been abandoned. So as we look here in Isaiah 40, starting with verse 27, we get, we get this. Uh, God, through Isaiah, speaking to the people, he says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Now there was a change there. Up until this point, God through Isaiah has been addressing primarily the southern kingdom of Judah. The language has changed now, shifted to Jacob and Israel. That's two names for the same guy and the same nation of Israel. So at this point, God is going to say some things, not just to the southern kingdom in Babylon, but also to the northern kingdom who long ago got conquered by the Assyrians. He addresses them this way, Jacob and Israel... I think on purpose to remind them how they came to be the nation that were his chosen people. If you remember, God picked Abraham out of all the people of the earth. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build my chosen people through you. And Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob was a scoundrel. He was a trickster. And after many years of uh, rebellion and, and doing things not the way that God wants him to, we're told that, that God, or God in the representation of an angel, shows up one night and wrestles, physically wrestles with Jacob through the night. And that's a turning point in Jacob's life. God renames Jacob that night to Israel. Now, Jacob was not a particularly flattering name. It's the idea of he who grasps the heel speaking of how he came out of his mother's womb, but also he cheats would be another name for the word Jacob. If your name is Jacob, I'm sorry to pick on you this morning. 
Now, at this turning point in Jacob's life, God renames him Israel. You think, well, that it's, it's got to be better. Well, Israel means he strives or struggles or fights or wrestles with God. This is how God chose to define or name his chosen people. Right? He could have called them anything, and they'd be known by the people of whatever instead of the people of Israel, but he chooses to name them the people who fight with God. And if you know the history of Israel, you know that they lived up to that many, many times, just like we tend to do. We, as his chosen people of the new covenant, we still are quick to fight with God. That could be arguing with him, that could be insisting on our own way or our own timing. It could be accusing him of forgetting us, abandoning us, or just doing a lousy job of being God. But we are amazingly quick to fight with the one who calls us his own. What is it that Israel said here? They said, my way is hidden from the Lord. My right is disregarded by my God. They're essentially saying, God can't see me. I am invisible to him. He doesn't know what's going on with me. Which is really absurd, considering how the Bible presents God as all-knowing, as omnipresent everywhere at all times. There's nothing hidden from him. And yet, the people of Israel here, <clears throat> sorry about my voice, the people of Israel feel as though God has abandoned them and, and don't, don't, doesn't even see them. Our way is hidden from God. Now, last week, we read a short passage out of Matthew that speaks directly to this. It's words of Jesus helping us understand that we are not invisible to him. This is Matthew 10, 28 and 31. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now that's kind of a strange way of talking. But the point is clear. Jesus is saying, you guys, you're more valuable than sparrows. God knows all the sparrows. He knows when one falls. He knows everything about you, even the hairs on your head. That's Jesus assuring us that God is paying attention, that he knows we are not invisible to him. Even when it seems like we've been cut loose and we're drifting through life with nobody watching over us. It is not true. They also say that their right is disregarded by their God. Now, in the U.S., we have what we like to call inalienable rights. It's the idea of rights given to us by God. Now, there, some of them are named in our Constitution, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, um, you know, free speech, the right to assemble. There's a whole bunch of things named in that Constitution. But in order to understand the purpose of our Constitution, we have to understand that the founders believed those rights were given to all humans by God. The Constitution doesn't give them those rights. The Constitution and the government formed by the Constitution are to protect those rights, but those rights come from God. I wonder what the Israelites thought were their God-given rights. What are they talking about? when they say to God here that, that our, our rights are disregarded by our God. Well, based on the context, the only thing I can come up with is their right to complain to God is being disregarded. Right? We, we want to convince ourselves that we're the center of the universe and we want to believe that we can tell God what to do. It's built into us deeply from our first ancestors. Does anybody remember the slogan for Burger King from 1970 up until this year? What was it? Have it your way. Yes. 
This year it was changed to you rule. Okay? So I took this picture at a Burger King a couple weeks ago, north up by Grand Rapids. Um, I, I understand what they're saying, right? They want you to come in, customize your Whopper however you want it. That's been Burger King's thing for 50 years. But to tell their customers that they rule, that really feeds into our ego, doesn't it? Get it? Feeds into our ego. Come, come on. Okay. <clears throat> this particular sign says, only one matters, meaning us, you rule. Now, this is absurd, obviously, and they don't even believe it anyway. They're just using us to make money, right? But it, it plays to who we are, right? We want to rule. And the people of Israel, just like we do, the people of Israel here wanted to rule, and we wanted to question God. We wanted to ask him for help and expect him to show up. In the next verse, through Isaiah, God is going to respond. He's going to show up to this accusation that has been leveled against him. He says in 28, Have you not known, have you not heard, that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Basically, he says, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Have you forgotten who I am? I am the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And my understanding and my power, you can't comprehend them at all. We're going to talk about this when we get into Genesis. But one of the most important things to understand from the Genesis account of creation is that there is God and then there's everything else. And those are completely separate. They're essentially made of completely different stuff. And here, God, the, the one who is outside of and over and reigns over everything that he's created, has received an accusation from his creation and said, you have forgotten who I am. And he mentions his great power. He talks about how you know, he doesn't grow faint, he doesn't grow weary, like we do, and his understanding is unsearchable. God created everything that exists in six days. Genesis 1 tells us that. He could have just done it in an instant, but he lays it out over six days, setting a, a pattern for us and, and building some beautiful imagery and, and rhythm and repetition into the process. And each of those days ends with a statement that it's good till you get to the last day, and then it's really good. And when he's done with that, he doesn't collapse onto the couch in exhaustion. Like, whew, that was hard, separating the expanse from the waters today. Wow, that wore me out. Not true. He could have just kept on creating and creating and creating and never wear out. Unlike us. Whatever your, whatever your work is, however you spend your time, even if you really love it, you do too much of it, it wears you out. But God is fundamentally different than us. He never grows faint. He never grows weary. And he's reminding the people of that here. And then he says that his understanding is unsearchable. You wouldn't even know where to start to try to find what you're looking for in the giant library that is God's understanding. Now, it would have been completely, like, Isaiah would have no idea what to do with this. But when we think of the word search, we probably all think of Google, right? Imagine how far that is from Isaiah's understanding. How, how much information is there in the internet? Nobody knows. There's no way to find out. It's too big. It's too decentralized. And it's constantly changing. But we can know a little bit about Google, the great search engine. <clears throat> Google. I lost my number here. There it is. 
Google processes 20 petabytes of information every day. That's 2 billion gigabytes per minute. Now, when I was in late elementary school, my family got a Commodore 64 personal home computer. It was awesome. Like, friends on the block, they had some Ataris. Nothing compared to the Commodore 64. That got me started in uh, loving and understanding technological stuff, learning how to, to write programs, I playing lots and lots of games. I loved that computer. And it stored information on five and a quarter inch square floppy disks. You guys remember these. Some of you do, right? One of those disks can hold up to 177 kilobytes of information. Like every picture on your phone is a lot bigger than that, right? If you were going to take the amount of information that Google processes in one day and you were going to store it on these floppy disks, and then you were going to lay them out in a single layer on the ground, you would cover 667 acres of land with these. So if that's hard for you to picture, you go out the door, turn left, go to Floating Bridge, turn left, go to DeLong, turn left, go to 216, and come back to the church. That is roughly 600 acres. That's just one day of information from one provider, Google. How much information is How much information is in all the minds of all the humans that exist? And yet God's information collection is, it's on a whole other scale, unsearchable. God knows all there is to know, and all there is to know in the future, too. Who could search that understanding? Well, nobody. And that's why God's asking the Israelites this. Verse 29. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. So it's not just that God has enough power to keep himself going indefinitely forever. He gives power to others. So if you've got a little battery pack that you use as a booster for your phone, you think of God as the cosmic battery booster that never needs recharged, never wears out. I know that's silly, but you get the idea. So much power, unlimited power, our brains don't even imagine what that means, able to give power to others, those who are faint, those who are weak, and still have unlimited power at his disposal, unlimited strength. Some of you have known what it means to be strengthened by God. You've been weary, you've been faint, you you haven't known what to do next, you haven't had the strength to keep going, and God in his goodness and in his grace and his generosity has supplied you with the strength that you needed. You have seasons in your life you can look back at and you can say, I would not have made it through that if God hadn't strengthened me. If you've got a story like that, I encourage you to share that with somebody this week. They need to hear it. Maybe you're weak and exhausted today. Maybe you're worn out right now. <clears throat> Maybe like my voice, you don't have much left. As life, family, work, ministry, the church, has it sucked you dry? Will you turn to the one who never grows weary and never faints? Verse 30 says, even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. If you're older, you know what this is talking about. You had more strength when you were younger, and even if you've worked hard to maintain your strength, there's only so much you can do as you get older. You can exercise all the time, and you're still not going to get back to where you were as a 20-year-old. Isn't that encouraging? But that's what God is, is getting at here. I think about the, the first time that I saw like a physical weakness in my dad. Uh, we had gone to uh, what's called Quetico Provincial Park. It's a giant chunk of land north of Minnesota in Canada. So if you've ever heard of the Boundary Waters in Minnesota, it's basically the same thing but the Canadian side. Just hundreds of miles of lakes and trees and rivers. 
And we went for a, a, a 10 day canoe trip just out in the middle of nowhere and saw almost nobody else that whole time paddling all day through a lake, along a river, portage through the woods, just paddling and walking and seeing beautiful stuff and catching lots and lots of smallmouth. It was a beautiful place. Had almost perfect weather the whole time until the last day. And on that last day, we had more than a 20-mile lake paddle. 20 miles on a lake is a long paddle, even if the weather's great. But the wind was in our face, and it rained almost all day. And some of these lakes are really big. So as, as you're paddling, now I'm in the front, so I don't get to see this, but in the back, Dad is constantly trying to correct to keep waves from coming over the sides of the boat, right? Because it's just, it's that kind of day. And we paddled and paddled and paddled all day and finally got to where we had left the car. And my dad was completely exhausted, could barely get up and get to the car. He couldn't help load anything. He could, we, so we had a, a 100-year-old old town canoe like this one, which weighs like 100 pounds. I had to put it up on the car and strap it down myself, you know, using ropes, so like having to do real knots um, in the rain. Now, dad couldn't help with any of that because he's completely exhausted. Me, as a 17-year-old, like high on the adrenaline of the challenge, like, I could do this all day. Let's keep going, right? But dad was older, and he had a lot more stress than I did because he was feeling responsible for me. He knew what was at stake with all the water trying to come into the boats, all that. He knew how weak he was getting and how much farther we had to go. That was weighing on him, and it wore him out. As a younger person, and as a less aware of what was going on person, I wasn't worn out. And God's referencing that here. He says, even the, even the young people, like I, I think about our school soccer team, right? Lots of really fit, strong guys, district champions this year. And there were, there were times when they would have a whole bunch of games in a week, just crammed one on top of another, Right? And maybe they wouldn't admit it, but by the time they were done with those multiple games, they were probably a little worn out. And then they had all the homework they had to catch up on, too, right? Even the young men, the soccer players, would wear out, this verse is telling us. Isaiah is saying this to the people of Israel, reminding them that God is not like you and me. He doesn't wear out. Now, they had seen him start with an old man, Abraham, and build an entire nation. They had seen him work through Moses, parting of the Red Sea, like stepping on a puddle and splashing it. It was so easy for God, right? They had seen uh, the power of God at work driving out the nations from the promised land. They had seen the power of God through their mighty king, David. They knew all this stuff in the history, but at this moment in their life, they're like, does God have any power? Can he do anything about us? And God reminds them of who he is. Now Isaiah ends this chapter with what is a familiar verse for many of us. It's actually the the theme verse for our school. So verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We're going to start with the promise of this. And we'll work our way backwards. So the people that God is referring to here will mount up with wings like eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Now, because we know the context of when this is being said, we know this isn't like talking about a a sports match. This isn't like a cross-country match or a soccer match, and you just you need some extra strength to keep going. This is this is talking to the people of God who have been in exile. They're they're coming up on 70 years of exile. And God is promising that he will bring them home. He will strengthen them to come home. He says they're going to mount up with wings like eagles. That doesn't mean they're going to sprout wings and fly. It doesn't mean like Gandalf and the Lord of the Rings are going to ride on giant eagles to get where they're going. This is a poetic way of God showing them the strength that he's going to give them. In 2018, on a family vacation, we went up the east side of Lake Superior. 
And uh, if you've ever gone up the east side, you know, it is a beautiful, beautiful place. Someday, I hope to go spend a lot of time, maybe maybe all summer, just slowly going around, seeing everything around the North Shore of Lake Superior. We've kind of gone up one side, and we've kind of gone up the other side, but never in the middle. Now, while we were there at the point on the, the map there, uh, we pulled off the road. Like, you don't have to work to get to this place. Pull off the road, and this is what you see, this next picture. Just amazing, right? Just sitting there next to the road. Just beautiful. And while we're standing there looking at that, an eagle flies by. And so I get my camera out and point it at the eagle. And that's as close as I can get because he's really far away. And I didn't realize something about the picture until we got home and I could zoom in further, which is this next picture here. It's a little pixelated. But you can see that the eagle is carrying a fish with him. right? And he's, he's grabbed the fish and he's turned the fish so he's cutting through the wind nice and efficiently with the fish. Now, I always picture the eagle comes down, grabs the fish like a barbell, right? And then flies off with it. But this particular eagle is smart enough. He's got it lined up for less wind resistance, and he's flying off to wherever he's going to feed his young or eat it in peace or whatever. We don't have bald eagles in the part of the world that Isaiah is riding, but we have eagles like this one. This is an imperial eagle. What a beautiful bird, right? Look at this next picture. Look at the character in that face. Like you, can, you can sense the personality of the bird just by looking at that. Right? This is what the Israelites are thinking in their minds when God says they're going to mount up with wings like eagles. God is promising his people that he'll renew their strength. Maybe this meant just a general encouragement, like you want to wait longer and then I'm going to bring you home. Don't worry about it. But remember, these guys are about to embark on their return trip. 70 years in captivity in Babylon. Almost none of them would have been alive when they went to Babylon as captives. Very few would have any memory of what Israel, the land, was like. Were they ready to walk a thousand miles up the Euphrates River and through Syria and then down to Jerusalem because you don't just cut across the Arabian Desert. They're going to walk to a land that most of them had never seen. Did they believe what their fathers and grandfathers had told them about it? Or did their fathers and grandfathers even know anything about what it was like now? Hadn't it been destroyed by the Babylonians? Yes. Jerusalem is destroyed. The cities are destroyed. Is there anything left? Have the, ground, have the fields all gone fallow? Have the wells been stopped up? Is there anything there for us when we get there? And these, at this point, they're city slickers. They've been living in the most important big city in the world at that time. For as long as they can remember, they've got to walk a thousand miles to get to a place that they don't know what it's going to be like when they get there. Someone's calling you, hon. That's <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. The hospital can wait. So they're, they're going to have to do this walk, and they don't know what they're getting into, and they've lived in the city, and can you think that they were going to get a little weary? Might some of them faint as they went? Do they need God to strengthen them so that they can walk and not collapse? Absolutely. And so ahead of time, years ahead of time, God makes this promise to them. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you walk and not grow weary. But there's a, there's a condition here, too. So God, God keeps his promises... And some promises he puts a condition on. And this one he, he puts a condition on before. What is that condition? Verse 31, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They who wait for the Lord. What does that mean? They've been waiting 70 years. How much longer should they have to wait, right? God is finally working on their behalf. 
to bring them back to the promised land. Is that what it's talking about? No, this is actually talking about something much bigger. This is a biblical principle. This little verse gives us an insight into how God works in general. Those who wait on the Lord will be strengthened by the Lord. It's true for us, just as it was true for them. What's the opposite of waiting for the Lord? Well, it's just not waiting. It's pushing on, rushing ahead, your way, your timing, your way of doing things, your control, and that describes us pretty clearly most of the time. We don't want to wait for God's timing. We want what we want, and we want it now. We don't want to wait for God's way. We want things to be done our way. We know the way that things should be done, and we will inform God because he apparently is not aware of the right way of doing things or the right timing. We want to maintain an illusion of control, and it is an illusion. None of us are in control. I was reminded of that this week as something went wrong in my back, and I'm not in control. You know, I'm in, in the ER with my wife, and um, trying to either like get off of the bed or go to the chair or whatever, and I move a certain way and uncontrollably just yell out like somebody stabbed me. Right? I feel bad for everybody else in the ER rooms next to me. Like, what is going on over there? Not having the ability to just close my mouth and be quiet. Some of you have experienced that, but all of us have experienced the reality that we're not in control of our lives. We can plan. We can have the best plan. A little thing can go wrong, and the plan goes completely out the window. We are not in control. We want to believe we are, but we're not. I wonder if there's a situation in your life right now where you're trying to be in control, trying to, maybe even politely, inform God of what he should be doing. And what would it look like for you to wait for him? So some of your translations use the word hope instead of wait. I, I like that because waiting is not just sitting around doing nothing. It's not just uh, you know a passiveness or a laziness. Waiting is actually a thing. To wait on the Lord to hope on the Lord, or we would say to rest in the Lord, is an act of faith. So Ray Ortland and Kent Hughes did a great job on a commentary that helped me with this, and, and they say this. They say, waiting is what faith does before God's answer shows up. God gives us great and precious promises, and then he calls us to wait. He never fulfills the promises right after he makes them. There's always waiting. In this case, 70 years of waiting. Are you willing to wait? Are you willing to let God set the pace? Or are you such a controller that you can't live on God's terms? Where do you need to wait for God right now? Where's the thing that you wish he would speed up or change directions or do something better than he's doing? And God says, just wait, rest, hope, trust me. Don't trust yourself and your own plan and your own timing. Trust me. You see how this ties in with the gospel? That we could, we could want to present ourselves to God as, as the best version of ourselves. We could say, I'm going to live really good. I'm going to be really generous. I'm going to go to church all the time. Uh, Whatever it is. And we could say, God, look how great I am. Look at all the work I've done. I've been really busy for you. And that doesn't get us anywhere with God. God calls us instead to rest in the grace and mercy that he extends to us. That if we're, if we're going to be welcomed into the family of God, it's not because we've been really diligent and, and hardworking and, and got a lot done for God. It's because of what Jesus has done for us and the gracious gift that he extends to us. To be born again necessitates waiting 
resting, hoping, trusting in the work that Christ did for us. It's not Christ's work plus the stuff you contribute. Just Christ's work. Until you get to that point where you're like, I I can't do it. I've just got to receive it. I'm going to rest in that. You're not in the kingdom of God yet. Maybe that's you today. And maybe this is a new idea to you. Not earning your way into heaven, but instead receiving life and resting in the work that Christ did for you. I pray that that would just catch into your heart and mind and it wouldn't let you go. That you'd have to wrestle through it the next few days. Maybe you are already in the family of God, but you're worn out, you're beat up. Maybe you're feeling hopeless. You're like, man, I, I got a hope for my marriage. I got a hope for my kids. I don't have any hope for whatever the situation is. I don't have the strength. I can't do it. I hope that these words through Isaiah to the people of Israel are encouraging. Wait on the Lord. Don't be lazy and passive. Waiting is an active thing. It's an act of faith. But wait, rest, hope, trust in the Lord. Whatever it is that you're going through, he understands it a whole lot better than you do. He's got purposes for it. He's got a plan for it. And if you wait for him, he will strengthen you. He will bring strength to the weary. He will help you run and not grow weary and walk and not grow faint when you wait on him. Will you not cry out to him today? Will you not surrender your plans and your timing and your will to him today and wait for him to strengthen you? Let's pray. Father, I pray for the the hearts that are heavy this morning, and maybe they just barely made it through the the Christmas season and they they don't have a lot of hope for next year. They need strength. I pray that you would help them to wait and trust in you. I pray that you'd help them to surrender their lives and their ambitions and their plans and their goals to you, that they would walk faithfully and humbly behind behind you as you lead them rather than trying to run ahead of you and be the leader themselves. Lord, some in this room are are just kind of disposed, supernaturally disposed to trust you. I give you thanks for doing that in those lives. Would you use them to encourage us? For those who have had seasons in their lives where they can look back and they can say, God strengthened me. Would you use those stories as testimonies, as witnesses to what you've done, the the truth of this promise. Lord, for those who are uh, just feeling like they're at the top of their game, they've got their strength, maybe they're young, they feel like they're ready to conquer the world, Lord, I pray that you would help them to see their great need for you, that they wouldn't be blinded by their, their physical strength or their mental sharpness or whatever it is that they take pride in, but they they would be able to see the, the, the humongous difference between them and you and know how much they need you. And so, Lord, if it, if it, takes, um, if it takes an intentional uh, weakening of them so that they can rely on your strength, Lord, we, we pray that that would happen. For we know that they will be far stronger, far more useful for the kingdom if they are strengthened by you than if they're strengthened by themselves. Lord, help us to come to you as the source of our strength. Not rely on ourselves or on a substance or on entertainment or the other things that we run to, Lord, but that we would come to you and take you up on your promise that those who wait on you, you will strengthen. We know that you are almighty, We are far from that. And so now we worship you, our almighty God. In Jesus' name, amen.